my goodness, because you see, on the heels of this Easter victory, we often find ourselves on a journey. And this journey is paved with our own expectations, with our own dreams, with our own desires about where we're going to go or what we thought life was going to be about or what we thought we were going to achieve by the certain age in our life or where we thought we might already be or some of the movements we might have already had in our career. There's, we're all on this road. We're on this journey where we are trying. We, we have a, something in front of us when all of a sudden, bam. God does something in your life, or God starts to get your attention like you haven't, that that hasn't happened before, or you're just, things are starting to turn on inside your soul where you're hearing things a little differently, or different things are getting your attention and making you wonder, hey, is God speaking to me? Is God trying to get my attention? You see, this is when God, he dramatically rearranges our journey. And when we get to that point on our road, we find ourselves with a good friend named Saul. A good, name, a good friend named Saul, who, who was later named Paul, you hear me. But you see, his name, he starts out with just Saul. And he starts out as Saul because he is on a road and he has expectations about what the journey is supposed to be like. And we're going to find out from Saul and, and also another good, God, another good friend named Ananias about what happens on the road. So I want to speak to you from the topic, the road. And listen, let me tell you this. This is breaking news, y'all. It's breaking news because the Lord is risen and he's alive forevermore. But now what does that mean for you and for me? What does that mean for our families? What does that mean for this journey that I'm on? You see this road that I'm on and what better road? Who has a more spectacular road or a heavy burden on the road than this guy named Saul? And so that's where we're at today. And the, the reading of the word was done in Acts chapter 9, and that's where we're going to continue going. All right, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19 is where our text comes from today. And so I want you to know God wants to get your attention this evening. I've been excited about sharing this word, and this has been a hard one, too. Working through it has been on the, on the challenging side, but I know it's only because God is trying to do something in my life, in your life, in our lives. And so God is going to be joining us on our road today in the view of the risen Savior and what we see what happens when things change, when things, the road don't look like it used to look or something happens and and I'm scared, I'm fearful, I I don't know what the future uh, to expect of the future. So Jesus does three things to Saul and Ananias' life. And the first thing that Jesus does is that he breaks in. You see, Jesus breaks in. And you know why he breaks in? Jesus breaks in, which is point number one. Jesus breaks in in order to break down, in order to break through. And that's where we're going to be landing in our time this evening. Jesus breaks in your life and in our life in order to break down so that we can have breakthrough. And so we're here in Acts chapter 9. Of beginning at verse 1. And you just, we're just going to walk this out real good with one another, okay? The verses are on your handout, um, so you have them available to you. They'll also be up on the screen as we go through it, but we're going to walk it out. But this first part, what does it mean for Jesus to break in our life? Because here we have it, right, in verse 1. It just starts out, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. You see, so we got this guy named Saul, and he doesn't like Christian. So Saul grew up in a city called, called Tarsus. And it's kind of like, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a Greek town. So he grew up speaking Greek, okay? But his native tongue is Hebrew, okay? And so, but he grew up in a place called Tarsus. And he was, when Jesus uh, was on the cross, that happened for us last week, what we celebrated, Paul was probably, he was probably around 10. Historians can't be exactly sure how old Paul was, but he was, a, he was most likely a young boy when Jesus was hung on the cross. Okay, and so time has passed between Jesus um, hanging on the cross, rising again, and then, but he grew up in a family. Hello, this was, he grew up in a family where uh, he learned how to hate those who follow Jesus. 
okay, where he learned how to discriminate against those who do not love or who, who, who follow Jesus. And that's often where we pick up a lot of our discrimination. That's a, lots of, a lot of places where we pick up how we hate or how we learn to view other people. It is in our families. That's why it's so important that as a family or as parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, that we are teaching our young people, right, how to um, view people and understand people. Okay, so this is where Paul is. And so it's, Saul says he was, it was breathing out murder threats against the Lord. You see, a shockwave of fear is felt as we encounter the description of Saul because he's still breathing out murderous threats, it says. And this is the one time I might prefer a different version than the NIV because it says murderous threats when really it's, it's threats and murder. You see, so Paul is breathing out threats and murder, but the NIV puts them together and saying, says murderous threats. But he's, he's spewing out threats and murder. You see, and this is what's happening here. And so then it goes on to say, he went to the high priest in verse 1. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, everybody say the way whether men or women, say men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Okay, so Saul has grown up and he does not like those who are following the way. He does not like those who are trusting Jesus, right? And so he is trying to, so he, he, he devises a plan. And his plan is to go to the church where Christians at the time, they were brand new Christians, right? They had been Christians for some years by now, but they've been following the Lord. It was still very small um, in terms of the following that, that was there, but they would still go to the synagogue. And so Paul, Saul, he would show up at the synagogue and he would look for people to try to confuse and ask them, who do you love? Who do you serve? And he tries to trip them up so they can commit blasphemy according to Jewish law. And then once, uh, once they commit blasphemy in the synagogue, now it's legal to arrest them. And then once they get arrested, it's like a domino effect. They catch a case in the judicial system. So they go before a judge. Saul shows up at the court case and says, yeah, they committed blasphemy and they've done some other things. Yeah, you know that Jesus guy that was messing up this whole empire and stuff? Yeah, yeah, he's the one that's following them. And so then he would give a, be a witness to their bad behavior and they would get sentenced guilty to death. So that is the domino effect that Saul would do. So he reached out to high priests at different churches in Damascus saying, I'm going to be showing up on such and such date. Let's have a special service, invite everybody in so I can trip them up, okay? And Paul, Saul goes on to talk about this later in Acts chapter 22. But he's doing this. These are the threats, and this is the murder that he's getting involved in. But you got to know, you see, Saul is a killer, we, got it. we can't forget that. You see, Saul is a killer. He kills in the name of righteousness, and now he's seeking legal permission to discriminate against the followers of the way to the point of imprisonment and murder. So Saul would, though, and so that is his plan he has. And it says of the way. The way is what people who love Jesus or trusted Jesus were called before they were called Christians. Okay, the way was like the first title that people had. And that comes from Isaiah chapter 40. If you could put that up for me, please. Isaiah chapter 40, where the way, come, where, where we develop the way, because it's in Isaiah where it says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the what? For the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. This is in the context of Israel being restored and God was going to make a way in the desert where there's dry places. You see, when God does break in, when the Lord does break in, he will do it in the dry places of our soul, the dry places of our work relationships, of our marriages, of our homes, because we are people of the way. And when you are people of the way, you are expecting God to make a way, to come through where the, it's desolate land because we know God's a redeemer. So they were comfortable with being called people of the way. You see, that's why they have that name. So the way is this path on which God will travel to restore God's people. And then it goes on to say Saul was going after who? Just men or just women? Men and women. This is an important fact. In fact, this is an important fact because Paul is going after those who are teaching the way, 
who are teaching about, who are talking about the way. Because you would only end up in church, synagogue, but just walk with me, right? We would only end up in church speaking about, the, about Jesus if you are teaching or sharing a testimony or you're, you're talking about why others should believe in the way. So Saul would try to catch him up in there. And that's why Saul was looking for not just men, but women. And this is one of the indicators, one of the many that we come across in the New Testament of how men, that gives evidence to how men and women are both teaching the gospel in the synagogue. Because Saul is coming to not just look for men. You see, he's looking for men and for women. And so that's an important part about this, about this passage that we see here. The whole book of Romans, in fact. Chapter 16, we see the last chapter in the book of Romans, when it's Paul, he sends the letter Romans to this woman named Phoebe. And so Phoebe was a wealthy woman. She owned her home. And this is what, this is how they did it when they're um, in churches during that time. People would come in, they would come to Phoebe's house and Phoebe received this letter in the mail, you know, by mail in that time. And she would then read the book of Romans right? She's just reading the book of Romans as this letter to the con or to the, the, the way, to the people who are here to learn about Jesus. You see, so we see already Paul is very comfortable and aware of the fact that women are a part of who is teaching the gospel to those who call themselves followers of the way. Are y'all, are y'all tracking me still? All right, so Jesus is breaking into all of these things because keep tracking with me. At verse 3, it says, as he neared Damascus. So Saul is coming on his journey. He's on his road. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, somebody say suddenly. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Oh my God goodness. You know, this is what's happened on his road, how when Jesus breaks in, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So already, so he's on the road, and when Jesus breaks in, it's really, there's no other way to describe and explain what happened other than it is a divine manifestation of God's power. It is God breaking into Saul's life amidst his hardened heart, amidst how he grew up and who he grew to hate and who he grew that he could not hang around with and who's and who's good to discriminate amidst all of this hardened of heart. God does this miraculous or this divine manifestation and a light appears before him. You see, and light is light, so it's, it's something bright. And then it says heaven, and the Bible describes heaven in, some, in sometimes three different ways. You can, in Psalm 19, it says the heavens declare the glory of God, but it goes on to talk about that's where the sun and the stars sit. So the Bible refer to heaven sometimes as talking about outer space, the home of the stars. Sometimes the Bible refers to heaven as the, the void between the earth and um and outer space so in genesis for example and it talks about the void it calls that the heavens so everything above the ground are what we call sky is the heavens there's also another heaven and that's where the lord resides okay and so there's all this these three ways that the bible talks about heavens how do we know where the light showed up how do we know which heaven we're talking about here when jesus breaks in Well, like anything, you only know by context. Okay, you only know by context. Paul, Saul, is on a road, and he bows down with the light. So by context, that leads me to believe that it is a light in what we would call our sky. Okay, so that's the heavens there. And he is overcome by the might of this divine manifestation. And he goes on to say, uh, track with me in verse 5, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And he says, I am Jesus, the one, why, the one you're persecuting, whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus. Ego, a me, a Jesus. We talked about this when, a few weeks ago, when you're tracking with me, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Ego, a me, ha, artas. Remember, the bread of life tastes is a waste. But he says the same thing here to, to, to Saul. Ego, a me, Jesus. I am Jesus. I am the one that was hanging on the cross. I am the one that died and stayed dead all day Friday. I am the one that people talked about and lied on. I am that one, and I am the one breaking in your life right now. 
So just in case, my friends, you're wondering who's breaking in your life in this season, and you're wondering, where are these signs coming from? I, I don't know. It's, it could be this. It could be that. Is it, there's, all, there's, there's many religions in the world. There's many world religions. And so who is it? You see, Jesus is clear in saying, I am Jesus. And I want to encourage you, if you're in that, if you're in that place and that you feel that breaking in of something that is beyond you, just ask, Lord, is this you? You see what solved is? Who is this? Just ask the Lord. Ask God, God, is something, are, God, are you trying to get my attention? Because when he breaks in, he will tell you, yeah, it's me that's breaking in. You see, so keep walking with me in verse 6. In verse 6, it goes on to say, now Jesus says, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. You see, I, why doesn't God, he just says, get up and go. Why doesn't God say, please? You know, I remember, this is like one of the most embarrassing things I remember in seminary. I had like, when I was in my class with like my Old Testament mentor. I mean, he's a world-renowned scholar, John Golden Gate, right? World-renowned Old Testament scholar. I mean, he was my mentor and I, and I loved every class. I tried to get every class with John Golden Gate. I went, I had spent time in his home with his wife and his office hours. I was always with him as much as I could because of what his contribution to studying the Old Testament. And so, I remember being in Old Testament class, and we were talking about God and what God does, and I raised my hand, and as the words come out of my mouth, I wish, like, I could put them back in, because it was also one of those classes where, like, only the students in there, like, you got to know something to, like, you already got to know the Hebrew, you got to know all this stuff to, like, be in the class, you know, and I said, you know, why don't God say please? <laughs> well, you know, God just, he just commanding people around, just telling people what to do. Why doesn't God say please? You know, and, and, and Professor Golden Gate happens to be from England. And so he said, he, and man, he says, you know, uh, God doesn't need to say please. Manners are something that comes out of English aristocracy as a way of separating classes. So you, you use manners based on how to identify what class you're part of. It is a part of an economic stratification of a social creation, right? And so we know manners. I was like, oh, yes, indeed, that's absolutely right. When God tells us to do something, when he breaks in your life, let me tell you something, fans. He ain't going to use manners. So when you're looking for the please or can't you go now, I, I would just love it if you just go do this. No, God's not going to use manners. You see, so we got to know this about how God speaks and how we can recognize God's voice in our lives. All right. So when God says do something, it's just like it's just boom. All right. And it's just there. So God doesn't say, please. God don't say, please. So continue track with me in verse seven. So he tells them to get up and go into the city. Right. And then verse seven, the men traveling with, um, with Saul stood there speechless. And I mostly when I say Saul, I always naturally want to say Saul. Saul was a friend of mine in college. He taught me how to make chicken enchiladas, red uh, enchilada sauce from scratch. Great guy. So every time I see Saul, I always think about Saul. And that's just how he said it. I, saw, I, saw, I might just kind of slip out. So Saul, right? Saul stood there, speechless. They heard the sound, the men traveling with Saul. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. You see, the moment, this moment, when Jesus breaks in, it's a fundamental life change for Saul. It's something utterly different. And what I want to help us with today, as Jesus breaks into our life, this fundamental change can often happen with how we understand the difference with the relationship of rest and work. You see, because Saul becomes blinded on his way to Damascus, Saul is forced into a physical state of rest. You see, and he's forced into it. He is on the job. He's doing something that he thinks it's right to do, but he's on mission. But he is stopped in his tracks, and he must rest. You see, uh, and so blinded and led to Damascus, Saul is forced into this state of rest and pause. And, and it's here in this state of pause that we're going to see that it is fertile ground to receive what God has. 
Who in the room this evening is just feeling like, you know what, I'm, feeling, I, I'm in a forced pause, or I'm in a forced state of rest, or there's something that has happened on my road that has utterly changed what I thought was going to happen. J something has broken. I didn't know if it was Jesus. I didn't know what was going on. Someone has broken in, but this utter change is on my road. And so what Saul comes here to tell us all the way from Acts chapter 9 is what is your rest? like this evening what is your rest like this evening and what is your waiting on God like this evening the period of waiting on the Lord reflects the way that Jesus breaks into our lives my friends in unexpected and sometimes rude ways and rude doesn't even apply because that's another manner term but God is rude sometimes I got something going on God why don't you wait till I'm finished with this project why don't you wait till I can save up some more of this no God will put you on mission God will send you out to do something. God will put something in your heart or in your mind to do. And it is just to be done. You see, this is how Jesus breaks in into our life. And so it's the purpose to help recognize God's plan in our lives over our immediate desires. And Jesus breaks in to give us life, to give us direction, to give us hope, to give us peace, to give us rest to give us comfort. Are you ready? Is, is Jesus been breaking in in your life? Or maybe you are in need of a break in, huh? Maybe you're in need of a change. You're on this road and you don't know how it's going to change. Well, Jesus is here to break into our lives. So one, he breaks in, but why does he break in? Jesus breaks in for number two, to break down. See, I want you to track with me here because the breakdown is in recognizing that your journey is not going to go the way you thought it was because the power of God is always going to take us beyond our comfort zones. Let me tell you something. You see, God's life takes us beyond our comfort zones in order to fulfill unique vision, unique mission, a unique, I, and sometimes I like to use instead of mission, I like to use adventure, because that's what mission really is, and the church says the word mission a lot, and so we've gotten really used to it over the centuries of using it, which is fine, but it really is an adventure, you see, it's on a mission, you got to think about Tom Cruise, like when he's on Mission Impossible, it's an adventure, you know, you're jumping from planes, and that, you know, you, like, it's an adventure, now that doesn't mean it's always high energy, but it means you're, you're doing something for the Lord, you see, and it's not always in your comfort zone, and this is why I encourage those who are people love the way at least twice a year you know that verse in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7 where it says you walk by faith and not by sight um, I always as a rule I always encourage people um, if you're walking with the Lord at least once or twice a year you should be able to identify a time where you've put your faith at risk you see or you put your life or your resources or your time at risk because uh, walking by faith and not by sight <clears throat> is a regular reminder that we can't always walk based on our senses, what we smell, taste, understand, rationalize. Yes, God gave us the mind and we should use it without a doubt. Come on, use that brain. But there are a couple times a year. When's the last time you, you, you risked your faith for the Lord? When you've like stepped out there onto this mission that God said, you know what, soul, you know what, son, you know what, daughter, I'm encouraging you to do this. So uh, once or twice a year, just keep it in mind. Have you done it already yet this year? It's just March, so we're still good. It's April now. And so it's here, though, that there's a disciple who Saul, reads, who, who Saul meets on the road to Damascus, and his name is Ananias. Ananias is this Damas Damascus disciple. And look at what happens in, let's see, verse, uh, verse 10. <clears throat> verse 10, right? So he comes, it says in verse 9, rather, for three days... Paul was blind, or Saul was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. And in verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. And what does Ananias say? Thank you so much. I got one person who's with me. What does Ananias say? Do you remember that one little guy, and he was a young guy in the book of 1 Samuel, and when God called out to him, he said, uh, Sam, or Samuel, Samuel, what does Samuel go do? He goes to Eli, right, and says, Eli, did you call me? Right, and he does it three times. God calls his name. 
And Samuel doesn't hear it. And on the third time, he finally says, oh, yes, Lord, it's me, speak. Or, Lord, that's you, speak. Ananias is the kind of person that we can learn from today. It doesn't take him three times to hear it. It doesn't take him two times to hear it. But it takes on the first go around. He says, yes, Lord. Is that you today? If God were to get your attention as he breaks in your life, is it, is it going to be more? And listen, we, we all fall short. I'm like a Samuel sometime. It's going to be the third, fourth, fifth time where I'm saying, Lord, is that you? But you see, we can be like Ananias the first time. Yes, Lord, I hear you. You see, yes, Lord, I hear you. I hear you speaking. And so then the Lord begins to give a vision to Saul. Verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. Okay, so God is speaking to Ananias in a vision. And then there's like a vision within a vision because he's talking about a vision that Paul is having at the same time. This is getting deep. All right, so verse 12, uh, it says, In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Okay, this, this straight street, right? Ananias lives in Damascus. Can you go to a, a slide for me where straight street still exists, still stands today? You see, and, and, um, and uh, Ananias, he lives in like downtown Damascus. So you only live in downtown like today. You only live in downtown. You only own a home in downtown if you are perhaps more wealthy or you have those resources because it tends to be a, more expensive to live in downtown. Okay, um, Judas who lives in downtown. And this is not Judas Iscariot, right? But this is a different Judas. His house is on the streets, about 40 feet wide, those Corinthian columns surround it. You can still see it today. Judas lives on the street, and Saul gets in Damascus and goes to this house, and Ananias is told to go into this house. And so what we see, this breakdown that is happening, is because we have to compare this vision that is, ha- this vision that is happening where, uh, oh, I, I want to give this to you too, because in Samuel, you remember as we keep this in mind, but in Samuel, when he didn't hear God the first time or the second time, it was because um, the priests in that time were backsliding. All the pastors weren't doing right. And because all the pastors weren't doing right, um, it says in verse 1 of Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, the word of the Lord was rare during that time. So it matters very much, Lord, help me, give me strength, that those of us who are ministering or who are followers of the way, who are pastoring, who are ministering, that we live a life that is worthy of the call that God gives because it actually impacts how other people engage God's word. And, and I know that there are some in our community, some here, some of my neighbors who maybe been hurt by the church, hurt by someone who you called a pastor, or hurt by someone who, uh, who you trusted. And, and I am just so sorry that that happens. And, what we, and that's why I'm so grateful that one, God is um, a forgiver of sins, but that here at Beyond Church, we're constantly trying to weave up a culture where one, we recognize no one is perfect, but where for me as a pastor, I am, I have uh, accountability circles and I have people in my life who can hold me to accountable to the things of my heart, who can call the things out on my life. There's people in this room who will call things out on my life when they see things going on. Why? Because it matters. It matters. And so it doesn't mean we stop hearing from God, though, my friends. It just means we have to continue trusting the Lord through that hurt and that trauma. And just like in the life of Samuel, God will bring restoration. God will bring replenishment as you continue to take a step at a time and trust the Lord with what's gone in your life. And so I'm going to, and so we see here, though, that God, that the Lord is not just, he's breaking in to break down. So Ananias, as we keep on reading, I'm going to come to it in verse 13. Um, Lord, Anani- Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. You see, my friends, you see, Ananias he too was afraid of Saul. He heard some things about him that he didn't like. He didn't want to hang around him. He heard he was a conservative. He heard he was a liberal. He heard he voted this way. He heard he was like this. And so he didn't want nothing to do with him. You see, he, he heard that he lived his life like this. And so he, he didn't want nothing to do with him. 
But what God does to Ananias is still say, you know what, son? No, go. Go to him. So Jesus is breaking down Ananias and even the things that are built up, the walls built up in him that keeps him from being on mission, that keeps him from doing the things that God has called him to do. And so Ananias is here and he is helping us understand that there are things, what is going on in your life? Who is that person in your life or those people in your life that you just try to keep a 10 foot pole distance with, but God is actually calling you to minister to? That the people or person in your life that you say, you know, no, they, they too X for me, or they too Y for me, or they post too much about this for me. Listen, I, I got those thoughts. But it is when we have to listen to the Lord, he'll lead us to how we can minister and serve those people, to serve all people around us. And that's why at Beyond Church, we're here because we belong in community, And so this is what's happening here as Jesus is breaking down Ananias and the things that are going on in him. So we have one, two, three, and as we come to a close, one, allow Jesus to break into your life. He'll do it. He'll break in on on your road and he'll do some things or speak some things in your heart or in your life. And you're now you're you're considering my whole life is going to be different. This is Saul. And then he'll bring you to a point where you're feeling broken. Like the the people that I know I just want to kind of stay away from. He's calling me to serve them. He's calling me to get up close with them. He's calling me to love my enemies. He's calling me to forgive the person after they said this to me. He's calling me to, to, to go actually talk to that neighbor that I've been trying to keep my distance from. God is breaking in in order to break down in us. And that is the posture, though, where God gives us your mission. So if you are wondering on your road, what's next? What is um, coming down the road, down the pike? What is it for the future? Well, as Jesus breaks in and you say, yes, Lord, as Jesus breaks in and you say, God, I hear you. Now it's time to be broken down. God, what needs to be taken out of my heart? What do you need to take out of my soul and do not put it back in there? This is why it says, as you think about visions and seeing God, you know, one of the Beatitudes, the sixth one, in fact, in Matthew chapter five, blessed are they who have a pure heart for they will see God. Oh, I got it. Thank you, Lord. Blessed are they with a pure heart. You see, a pure in heart is talking about someone you're not double-minded on the inside when it comes to trusting the Lord. You're not kind of one foot in, one foot out. You're not thinking about like, God, I'm not sure about this. But if you're really, if you need to hear from the Lord and you need to get a strong response from the Lord, you will see God as you come with a heart of purity to him saying, God is just you. God, it's an audience of one, and I want to worship. I want to serve you. I, I got it. I've been, there's been some go- things going on that are tough in my life, but Lord, I need you to help me through them. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm not going to get it right every time. I'm not going to be the best dad. I'm not going to be the best husband. Lord, help me. I'm not going to always get it right, but you can still be pure in heart. And it's not, you see, sometimes we think about purity and holiness, which is another word is there as as about behavioral modification. We think that holiness or purity is about something I have to do on the outside. But this is why Jesus is actually coming to reframe how people understood purity and holiness. That yes, there is a calling for all of us and an invitation for us to be holy today, tonight, where we are. But it happens where? in the heart first, because you're not going to do right unless you want to be right. Uh Uh-oh, somebody. Because you see, we're called human beings and not human doings. So it's not about what we do first, it's about what we, what we be, who we are in our heart. And as we are pure in heart, the things on the outside of our lives can then fall in place. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will come at it and be, come after it. Oh my goodness, I got to draw to a close. Because this is what's happening when you let Jesus break into your life, you then begin to break down down so that you can say yes to the Lord, yes to this mission, yes to what God is doing. And last but not least, I want to ask the worship team to come up on stage with me. Help me close this one out as we worship, as we try to go pure in heart to what the Lord is calling us to do. And that is as God breaks in, as Jesus breaks in, he breaks down so that there can be breakthrough. And if this evening you're in need of breakthrough, If you're in need of breakthrough, you are in the right place. Because you see, Saul was blinded. He had to rest, and he was blinded for three days. 
Hmm. Judas is in the story. I mean, the, the connections, too, between just the crucifixion story are really canning. But three days, he was blind. He could not see. He could not understand what was happening in his life. He could not understand what was going on around him. God had done something, but he didn't really understand how to make sense of it all. And it was three days that he was then, yeah, in Judas' house, Ananias came. And Ananias, it says, prayed over him. It says, in fact, laid his hands on him. And as he laid his hands on him, the scales begin to fall from his eyes. And, and Saul begins to see. And this is why it says in verse 17, it says, you know, placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul. This is the same Ananias who says, I don't know about going to someone so up close that I don't know, I, I don't vote like them, I don't eat like them, I don't do life like them. We're different ethnicities, we're different cultures. That's why here at Beyond Church, it's about what the, the barriers that Jesus has broken down so that we can come like Ananias. Once we might hate someone, we might be discriminating, we might discriminate someone, but we can come up and say, oh, brother Saul. And Ananias, as he lays his hands on, uh, on Saul, he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on that road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit, he then says. Oh, my goodness. And verse 18, immediately something like scales, which is the word um, like fish scales or the onion skin. Um, scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. You see that filling with the Holy Spirit. You see some here at Beyond Church, we have things like essentials and non-essentials. And, and so we believe that the Holy Spirit as an essential part is a ministering um, part of God, a ministering, the ministering spirit of God that moves across the face of this earth. But then the non-essentials as it relates to what salvation means, there's, I, the, there's a lot of diversity in the Christian church about what those gifts do and what those gifts are like. And here at Beyond Church, you see, I personally as a pastor believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the thing that scares me about the Holy Spirit and probably scares many pastors is that you can't control the Holy Spirit. And so we figure out ways of trying to like put the Holy Spirit in order, you know, and then we create these things. But you know what? You can't control it. And so here at Beyond Church, there is a freedom in God to let God use you as he fills you with his power. And something might happen next to you. I don't know what to do with it, you know? But we walk with it as a community of faith. And we grow with one another, how to support with one another through it. That's the best solution I have. But because being filled with the Holy Spirit is a part of what it means to witness, be a vibrant witness of Jesus Christ in this land. And so tonight you might have felt something tugging on your heart or you might have felt something, heard something in your ear and I want to encourage you today. That is God's spirit. That is God getting your attention saying, daughter, I've been, I've been knocking on the door of your heart. Son, I've been knocking on the door of your pride or the door of your ear so that you would hear, that you would hear me and now would you be filled with my power, with my peace, and be filled? And you know what happens? He then got baptized. Because that's what happens when we have new life. And if that's you tonight, that, you are, that you've got new life tonight, that you need a fresh start, that you've been looking at life one way, you've been on your road, and, you, and you've been trying to muster up all the strength you could, you've been trying to muster up all the peace you could, but you keep losing it every day. Your kids keep taking it. The job keeps taking it. The worries become heavier than you think they are. You keep losing it. You see, get with Jesus and let him fill you with his very life. Let him fill you with his power. And if that's you tonight, it is your opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I hear you. We're not going to be Samuels in here. We're going to be Ananiases. On the first time, we're going to say, yes, Lord, change the way I walk. Yes, Lord, change the way I talk. Yes, Lord, change the way I see. Everybody stand up on your feet with me. Lord, I change the way I hear. Change the way I see my marriage. Change the way I see my work relationships. Change the way I see myself. 
because a wonderful change comes on you when we simply say on this road, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And so if that's you tonight, Jesus is ready to break in. And right now, I know there may be other people around you, but right now it's just between you and God. You see, and let God minister to your heart as he breaks in and he talks to you. He puts a balm of Gilead on that trauma, on that sadness. He has it tonight. Would you help me see? He has it tonight. He has it tonight. Thank you.